Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren. This week we take a look at some of the missing casualties of war. Americans taken hostage or traded like pawns for political leverage, ideology, or vengeance. Quite often, they're journalists or government workers or spies. But sometimes they are innocent bystanders, tourists, who find themselves at the wrong place caught up in moments of historic change or war. Who are these hostages? What is the U.S. government doing to help them? And what is it like for their families? We're on Facebook at Voice of America, and we would love to hear your comments and your questions. It is a family's worst nightmare. A son, daughter, brother, sister, husband, or wife kidnapped, held hostage, and then used as a bargaining chip by hostile governments or groups. Every case is different, but as Plugged In's Mil Arcega explains, all share a common thread of fear, anxiety, and despair, not just for the individuals who are seized, but for their families as well. Call it nationalism or misguided zeal, but the anger is real and the consequences sometimes tragic. Video journalist James Foley wanted to show the world the horrors of war, but his mission was cut short when he was captured in 2012. He was brutally executed two years later by a group calling itself Islamic State. Jim stood for, for love and hope. I mean, he went to Syria in hopes of bearing witness to all the suffering there so that people of the world might first become aware and then do something to alleviate that suffering. For many, Foley's execution, broadcast on YouTube, would mark the moment Islamic State became an existential threat to free societies. But not all hostages meet the same fate. One week after Foley's execution, the negotiated release of journalist Peter Theo Curtis, imprisoned for two years by a Syrian group linked to Al-Qaeda, would reveal a gentler side to humanity. Uh, I, I had no idea when I was in prison, I had no idea that so much effort was being expended on my behalf. Um, and now having found out, I am just overwhelmed with emotion. But even the best efforts to secure a hostage's release don't always end well. My name is Luke Summers. I'm 33 years old. I was born in England, but I carry American citizenship and have lived in America for most of my life. Summers was killed shortly it's after the release of this video during a failed rescue attempt in Yemen. Others, like aid worker Peter Kassig, who wanted to help the victims of war, would be remembered for their efforts to make the world a better place. In 26 years, he has witnessed and experienced firsthand more of the harsh realities of life than most of us can imagine. But rather than letting the darkness overwhelm him, he has chosen to believe in the good. The U.S. State Department, which keeps tabs of all U.S. nationals held captive by hostile groups or governments, say no efforts are spared to secure the release of all American hostages. That includes diplomatic deals and prisoner swaps, such as this one in 2016 when Iran freed five detained Americans, including Washington Post reporter Jason Rezaian, in exchange for clemency for seven Iranian nationals convicted or pending trial in the United States. But some hostages remain out of reach, including former FBI agent Robert Levinson, who was detained by Iranian security forces in 2007 while investigating a smuggling ring. 3,007 days later, we are still waiting for him to be released and returned home to us. No U.S. citizen has, has been held overseas longer than he has ever. One family who knows the heartache of their loved one being held hostage is the Tice family. I recently spoke with Deborah Tice, the mother of missing journalist Austin Tice, a freelance reporter who was covering the ongoing conflict in Syria when he was detained by Syrian forces in August of 2012. Now, six and a half years later, he's still missing. The family wants to make sure he is not forgotten using the hashtag Free Austin Tice. The family still does not know who kidnapped or detained Austin. All they know is that it has been almost 2,400 days since they last heard from him. Mrs. Tice, tell me, when was the last time you heard from your son Austin? Um, the last time that we heard from him was August 13th of 2012. And was that by an email or a conversation or even through his Twitter account or how, how was that? Um, I believe that was through a Gmail chat or something like that, yeah. And where did you understand him to be when he communicated with you? 
Um, at that time, he was in a suburb just outside of Damascus, planning to leave Syria. He had been there um, three months. So he was planning to leave and go to Lebanon. And that was the last time that we heard from him. What was he doing in Syria? He was in Syria working as a freelance photojournalist. He um, was very uh, unsettled when he heard that these stories were coming out of Syria, but they couldn't be verified because um, there weren't reporters on the ground. And so uh, he felt like he had the skills to go and to take a camera. He, his original mission was to be a photojournalist. And then one of his editors asked for some backstory on one of his photos. And when Austin sent the backstory, his editor said, now you're going to write. Mm -hmm. So then he started writing. When, when he told you he was going to Syria or he's going over to the region, um, well, what did you think? You know, it, it's not the kind of thing that you want to say, well, that sounds so much better than one of those internships you were offered. But all of his life, all of the kids have been told, be on your path, listen, listen for your calling. And so he really felt like that was his path. And having told him that all his life, I knew that he needed to go. Did you hear any information, you've been told anything that happened to him on or about that day or, after, or when he was kidnapped? You know anything at all about the kidnapping? Right, he was actually not kidnapped. He was detained at a checkpoint. And um, in the early days, the word that was, used, that was used most often was arrested, that he was arrested at a checkpoint um, just outside Damascus. And um, since then, no one has claimed uh, responsibility for having him or for holding him. And so, you know, we're six and a half years. This week it was six and a half years that Austin's been detained. And so what we're trying to do now is rather than reconstructing the history or figure out who's holding him, the important question we have is who has the authority to release Austin and how do we engage with them? That, that's what we're looking for now. That's I, our question. Have they given him any, have you been given any reasons for his detention other than that he went to some checkpoint at some point, someone decided to detain him? We, we haven't had any, any information from the time that, that we lost contact with him. The FBI has, has uh, announced uh, some time ago uh, a reward, is that right? Right, a reward of up to a million dollars for information leading to his release. And I believe that the National Press Club is going to coordinate with the National Restaurant Association to uh, match that fund. Have you met with President Trump about your son? We have. And when was that and what did President Trump say? He said, we are going to get him home. So that was almost a year ago in March. And is there, I mean, have you gotten any more information other than that? I mean, I mean I'm sure that that's consoling words to a, to a mother of a, of a son who's detained or, or in captivity. Um, but I mean, have you gotten any other information like we're getting closer or the Syrian government is responding or the group that's holding him is responding, that there's a dialogue going on? Well. I mean, understand that we do work really closely um, with our government. They share information with us much better now than they did in uh, 2012 and 13 and 14. Um, obviously, we can't share because then they won't want to share with us, right? But this administration has really shown itself to be dedicated to bringing Americans home. They have a track record. Um, so we know that they are putting a full frontal assault on this. They are putting all the effort in. But keep in mind, too, our side of the equation is only half. You know, we, we can sit at the table all day, but if no one shows up for the other chair, um, we're just waiting. 
You know, it's, it's so painful. I mean, it's, and it's happening, you know, in many nations, many times that Americans are sort of the pawns between, you know, disputes between governments or, you know, that it, it almost appears that, I mean, Austin's just a, a photojournalist, military background, student, um, and, you know, he is being held because of all problems of other people, not because of him. Right. And you see a lot of that whenever powers engage and they forget how their actions and decisions are going to affect um, other people, right? Yeah. It, it, I, and I imagine, I mean, I, I don't know if there's any way. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you never dreamed that you'd be someone who all these years later would be going on television around the world or any place basically begging for your son's release. Um, you know, it, it's, so many journalists are out there uh, who put their lives at risk in, in these war zones just trying to get the information out. You know, that is my primary job description right now is global beggar. That pretty much fills a lot of my time. Well, yes, and I never imagined it. Never. How could you possibly think this was going to be my path, right? Well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I was actually, though, quite heartened when, when I read that the U.S. government says he's alive and they seem very determined um, to do what they can to help you, but it's never fast enough. Well, and I mean, that was really an important statement for them to finally come and definitively say that publicly. Um, you know, it just erased the doubt. Uh, the parents never had any doubt, but um, I, I was, it was a big deal for that to happen, and we really appreciate Special Presidential Envoy Robert O'Brien making that statement. It was his first public statement since he had taken the job. And we really do appreciate that because it made a difference for Austin and for us. You should know it's been a little bit of a struggle in the media because we haven't, and I say collectively speaking for other journalists and other news organizations, we haven't known how much of a spotlight to put on this or not put on this because we don't know if that helps or makes them a greater, you know, a higher value target. You know, you know, it's, it's been very difficult on so many levels, not, you know, to how to handle this for the, for the government, the family, and even for, for fellow journalists, because we'd like to see Austin come home yesterday. Right, right. And, and, you know, what we say is anytime you find yourself in a situation where you have an inkling that you should ask about Austin, ask, bring him up. What about Austin Tice? When are you going to bring Austin home? What's happening with Austin? Um, anytime you ever have any kind of stirring about that, bring him up. Say his name. Well, I'm sure that he knows you're determined to get him home. Um, you and your husband have been very determined, as, as all parents are. And as I noted, is that uh, next time you and I speak, I hope it's under very different circumstances. And we're talking about oh, a so very different I. part of the story. Anyway. Thanks, thank Greta. Yes. Thank you for joining me, and uh, let's bring Austin home. Thank you so much for having me, and yes, let's get Austin home. You may have noticed Deborah Tice's praise for how the Trump administration is working with the family and her criticism about how information was shared by the Obama administration. That criticism from the Tice family and others prompted President Obama in 2015 to create the Office of the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. That office leads and coordinates the U.S. diplomatic engagements on overseas hostage-related matters. It also facilitates better coordination with the families, bringing consistent senior-level attention to hostage issues. It also changed U.S. policy, allowing families to communicate with hostage takers. The U.S. still maintains it will make no concessions to terrorist groups holding American hostages. Austin Tice is just one of at least 11 Americans currently being held hostage or otherwise unaccounted for. Armando Torres was kidnapped at gunpoint at a ranch in Mexico in 2013. Authorities believe the former U.S. Marine may have been kidnapped by a drug cartel associates. Christian aid worker Jeffrey Woodkey disappeared in northern Niger in 2016. New evidence suggests he may have been trafficked to a neighboring state. American writer Paul Overby disappeared in Afghanistan in 2014. He was trying to interview the leader of the Haqqani Network, a Taliban faction. Kevin King, a teacher at the American University in Afghanistan, was kidnapped in 2016 by the Haqqani Network. 
They warn he is gravely ill and are demanding the release of Haqqani leaders in Afghan custody in exchange for his freedom. NASA scientist Serkan Golja was arrested in Turkey in 2016. He was suspected of being part of the political group accused of staging a failed coup against Turkish President Erdogan. He was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison, despite what the State Department called an absence of any credible evidence. Businessman Siamak Namazi was arrested by the Iranian government in 2013 on charges of espionage. A year later, his father, Bakir Namazi, was arrested on similar charges. Now 82, the elder Namazi is in poor health and his family fears he may die in custody. Zi Yu Wang, a naturalized American citizen from China, was arrested in Iran in 2016 for espionage. Wang had received a grant from Princeton University to study Farsi for his doctoral dissertation. Michael White, a U.S. Navy veteran, was detained in 2018 while traveling to Iran. He is the first American detained overseas during the Trump administration. And Robert Levinson was kidnapped in March of 2007 by Iranian security forces. He was last seen on Iran's Kish Island. The former FBI agent has been missing for nearly 12 years, the longest held U.S. hostage on record. Five-term U.S. Representative Ted Deutsch knows the story of Bob Levinson very well. He represents the 22nd District in the U.S. state of Florida, where Levinson's wife, Christine, lives. He has been a vocal advocate for bringing Bob Levinson home. I recently spoke to him about the case. There is, there is an effort, but the question is a really good one. Um, we need a greater focus on Bob's case. It's, it's now almost 12 years since he went missing, the longest held American in history. Uh, for his seven kids and six grandkids, we're coming up on another Christmas that they're not going to have Bob. And we need the administration to make this a priority. We need the American business community to make this a priority. It has to matter to everyone in our country that one of our own has been missing and we need to bring him home. And I would add we should make a priority, it could be for the media as well, because the power and the spotlight of the media would help since it's been going Absolutely. on since 2007. Um, he is a former FBI agent and um, other presidents, President Trump said this was going to be something that was going to be part of his administration. President Obama said that he was going to do something as well, and President George W. Bush said he was going to. No one's been able to find him, or no one's been able to get Iran to tell us anything about him. Why? Well, there's always, there's always been a reason. Uh, when the Iran nuclear deal was done, we had immense leverage at that moment that I, I think we should have demanded that, that nothing happen until Bob is brought home. We didn't do it then. The, we've, the families met with the Bush administration, the Obama administration, President Bush, President Obama, and President Trump. Uh, we know that people are saying the right things, but the family, it's now at the point where the family has had to do their own diplomacy. This letter that they sent out to world leaders is a plea for everyone to pay attention to Bob to make it a priority. We, there's a lot that Iran uh, needs from the world's community. This should be a priority. Wouldn't you think that if he were alive and being held by some group that they want to leverage him? Like, you know, we'll return Bob Levinson or we'll give you information as to what happened to Bob Levinson, Levinson in exchange for something. Has there been, do you have, have you heard of any effort to sort of leverage his kidnapping or disappearance? Um, well, I, I haven't heard of the Iranians dangling uh, Bob's release as part of some bigger deal. No, I haven't heard that. I, I do know that this is an issue that our government can make a condition. I think the Iran deal is one example. I think at this point, the president, President Trump, has withdrawn from the Iran deal. The Iranians are facing great pressure in their economy as the, the value of their currency plummets. There are real challenges to them. Uh, there is a moment now to, t to capitalize, for us to capitalize on that situation um, in order to help bring Bob home. We have to be looking at, at all of these. We can't wait around for the Iranians to come forward or, or someone that Iran may have dealt with to come forward and say, here he is, here's what we want. We have to, be, we have to use every avenue we have to make the communications to help bring him home. Well, I've met the family over the years, and I'm deeply disappointed that so many people have dropped the ball, whether it's our government or, um, or the media or politicians, whoever dropped the ball, because he is an American we have left behind. 
but I, I'm trying to think in my mind, obviously I want him alive, I'm trying to think in my mind, I said, why would he be held now without any word from any group, and what would be, why would they keep him and feed him and keep him alive without trying to get something out of it? Well, it's only, it's been so long, all we can do is speculate, but perhaps that was the thinking initially, and, um, and it becomes difficult now to, to try to acknowledge that or to acknowledge that he's been held. I, I don't know. We can only speculate about that. Um, but again, I, we can spend a lot of time thinking about what might be happening or we can devote all of the resources we have available to us uh, through all of the channels at the State Department and the NSA, the White House, uh, to make whatever contacts are necessary to help start a process. And, you know, and we, you know, in, in some ways, I mean, this family just wants information. Is that so much to ask? Oh, and they shouldn't have to work so hard to get the information. They should have someone that they can communicate with who reaches out to them on a regular basis to keep them apprised of, of any developments, all developments. That's the least that they should expect from, from our government when an American citizen uh, goes missing and is held for all these years. Jason Resign spent 544 days in an Iranian prison held hostage as the U.S. and Iran worked out the Iran nuclear deal. Resign, a journalist, was the Washington Post Tehran bureau chief in 2014 when he was arrested and locked up in solitary confinement inside Tehran's notorious Evan prison. He was released in January 2016, part of a prisoner exchange deal ahead of the implementation of the Iran nuclear deal. His book, Prisoner, 544 Days in an Iranian Prison, was published last month. Jason spoke to me about those dark days and the reasons why he believes the Iranian government targeted him. People who were the architects of my uh, arrests and the ones who uh, are trying desperately to keep Iran shut off from the rest of the world know that I didn't do anything wrong. But I think the lower level ones, the interrogators uh, and the people who were involved uh, in, in, in capturing me and others that were actually doing the work on some level have to believe it uh, to continue doing this work. But ultimately, uh, you know, I recount in the book that at the very end, my interrogators say, we know you didn't do anything wrong. I don't know. And you they, hugged him. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, it's a human when relationship. when you left, we left. When I left, I, I hugged my interrogator, not because I liked him, uh, but because we'd spent a year and a half. You've seen Rocky. At the end of Rocky, you know, they, it's, it's a, they go to blows, they go to 13 rounds, and, uh, you know, one of them wins and the other one doesn't. They're both bloody, they're both tired, and they hug each other. And that's what happened. Well, you know, looking now, reading the book, you think, you know, it's, it's a very captivating book. Thank you. But um, when, when you were there, and I would speak to your brother on occasion and interview him, uh, it was terrifying. I mean, it, I, I, did you feel when you were uh, incarcerated, the 544 days, did you suspect you might be executed? In the early weeks, I didn't know what to think. I was confused, I was scared, but I assumed that it would end. Then as solitary confinement dragged on, I became very desperate. And they would tell me that you're on the verge of execution. Within hours, we're going to behead you. What's that like? That's scary as hell. But the next day they would tell you, no, 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 no. We're going to let you go tomorrow, right? So it's this good cop, bad cop manipulation of the mind that goes on. Uh, and it took me many months to understand that um, my fate was, was tied up in this uh, negotiation with the U.S. and other powers, and that ultimately uh, the likelihood was that it was going to be the U.S. president that decided my fate, that he would be the one that would have to step in and say, enough is enough, we have to do whatever we can to bring this person home. And ultimately that's what happened. But it happened, the deal was struck, I think, about July 2015, and you didn't come home July 2015. You didn't come home until January, January 2016. That's right. So when July, when July 2015 rolled around and the deal was cut and you're still sitting in a prison and a pretty awful prison in Tehran, what did you think? That was a low point for me. Uh, I had believed, and I think many other people believed, and in the, in the, in the West, in America, in the media, uh, Iran watchers all thought that when the deal was signed that I would be released. When that didn't happen, uh, the sense of urgency, I think, for my family, for my colleagues at the Washington Post, and for the U.S. government rose exponentially. 
Uh, we didn't know this at the time, but there were secret negotiations going on for my release. Separate from the... Separate from the nuclear negotiations. With also the pastor, American pastor who was held there. Saeed Abedini and, and, and Amir uh, Hekmati, the Marine. Um, and a couple of other people who uh, were under house arrest in Iran who were also dual nationals that were ultimately released in exchange for seven Iranians who were imprisoned here in America. As I recount in the book, uh, those seven Iranians who were also dual nationals uh, decided not to go back to Iran. So, so they stayed here. They stayed here. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd, I'd stay here. How bad is solitary confinement? Solitary confinement should be outlawed uh, across the board, period. In the United States, in Iran, and everywhere in between. Uh, it's designed to, uh, to make you go insane if you're, if you're subjected to it. Uh, and in a lot of ways, it's very effective. The, the impact of that uh, becomes permanent after about 20 days. That's what all the science shows. I spent 49 days in solitary confinement. My With, what, just nothing to do? Not only nothing to do, you're in a very small space. How about big was your cell? Just slightly larger than this table. Which is what, uh, four by eight? About four by eight. Um, I had a, 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 a hole in the ground uh, for a toilet, and, uh, and that was my life. I paced the, the length of that. How many days? 49, uh, and 72 for my wife. So it's a, it's a horrible experience, and you know all it is designed to do, it's not designed to... Your wife was in, in solitary in for 72? 72, 72. I didn't realize that. Um, it's designed to, uh, to really disconnect you from reality. You don't have any, any sort of uh, sensory stimulation. You're not talking to anybody, obviously. There's no books to read. There's no television. There's no music. It is what it is called. It's confinement in solitude. Uh, and it's, it's torture. Food? Food was given to me um, on a twice daily basis while I was in solitary. Um, I have high blood pressure and I'm uh, on medication for that. My mother made a very big deal about that publicly uh, in the early days of my arrest and uh, they started medicating me. Each day they would take me uh, to have my blood pressure checked. I'd weigh myself. In the first 40 days of solitary confinement, I lost 40 pounds. Hmm. That's not a diet that I recommend to anybody, but well, it worked. Yeah, I'm in your book, and it's quite you know, exciting, and, and I tip my hat to the Swiss. The Swiss, have, you know, the Swiss were terrific in helping you get out and negotiate because we don't have diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Iran. Um, but, and I, don't want to, I, want, I want people to read your book, Thank you. and so I don't want to tell too much about, um, about your departure or anything, but uh, is there a way to describe uh, when those wheels lifted up from Tehran with your wife? on the plane and you were getting out of there? Well, I will say this. Uh, that deal that uh, transpired between Iran and the United States and other countries that ended uh, some of Iran's nuclear activities, lifted sanctions, and released me and others uh, was supposedly implemented on January 16th of 2016. My plane from Tehran didn't take off until about 4 p.m. on January 17th of 2016. That's about the last 30 pages or so of, of this story. Uh, and the, the stress of that last 24 hours is something that I, I hope to never repeat. Of all of those 544 days, the 544th uh, was uh, among the top two or three hardest. You can watch the entire interview with Jason Resign and Deborah Tice at voanews.com slash plugged in. That's all the time we have for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice America. You can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta. And do follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.